Um, so thanks for coming uh, to the talk. Hopefully this will be interesting and I uh, definitely invite questions as I go through this and then I'll try and leave a few minutes for questions at the end as well. Um, I, uh, I'm running the product group at Alpine Data Labs but I, I'm only going to partially focus on what we're doing at Alpine today. I want to address a broader topic which is um, essentially parallelized analytics through the use of uh, MPP databases. Um, and perhaps even more broadly than that, the, the idea that analytics, predictive analytics in particular, shouldn't be a laborious and painful and cumbersome and months long process, but instead should be something that's much more efficient uh, and that can be done in a much, uh, a much reduced time frame. Um, so first of all, I'll sort of define my terms, although I suspect for the people at this conference this is not necessary, but um, you know, people are talking a lot about big data and big data analytics and predictive analytics. Um, the way I view the world is sort of, uh, I don't think I'm alone in this by any means, but uh, is that we have largely, especially when it comes to larger data sets, focused on sort of simple aggregates, sort of OLAP reporting, business intelligence, whatever you want to call it, um, <clears throat> which is very good. In fact, it's, uh, it's uh, necessary, um, very important core component of running your business. Um, at, uh, and is used for telling you facts about the past. Uh, so indicating what has happened uh, so that you can make more informed decisions about what to do next time around. Um, so questions about what happened, where and when are a core attribute of traditional business intelligence. Um, and there's an interesting analogy here for some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about later. Um, namely that traditionally, or say, you know, more than a decade ago, a lot of OLAP and business intelligence was done outside of the database. So data would be extracted out of the databases into an in-memory cube and would be prepared then for reporting and analysis uh, the next day. And that worked just great, but eventually the databases caught up and through innovations through companies like uh, Teradata and uh, Natiza and uh, uh, Greenplum and so on, uh, you had the ability to perform large-scale computations in parallel and to do ad hoc reporting uh, that was, uh, if not real time, close to real time. Um, and I think there's an analogy there for the world of predictive analytics. I mean, this is all just advances in math that can happen in the database, after all. Um, and there's, there's sort of a, a spectrum, um, there's sort of continuum, really, from simple aggregates through to more complex aggregates and windowing and so on, uh, through to matrix manipulations and linear algebra to support uh, predictive analytics. Uh, so I really think it's a continuum, and I think that the database companies have done a good job of, uh, of uh, shifting themselves along that continuum. More of that later. So predictive analytics, then, is about getting beyond just simple facts about the past, but making some interpreta uh, interpretations. Uh, so more inferential statistics as opposed to purely descriptive statistics. So you can say, well, my sales went down in the Northwest in this particular set of products uh, last year, but now I can ask myself questions about why that happened. Maybe it was because of competitive pressures, or maybe it was because we raised the price, but we didn't do sufficient uh, outreach or uh, marketing. Um, and so you can start to ask those why questions, and as soon as you get answers to those, you can start to make, um, come up with ideas about how to do better in the future. So that's when you get into simulation, uh, what will happen under certain uh, scenarios, and then you can even get into optimization, where you start repeating many different scenarios uh, perhaps using optimization techniques to come up with sort of the best case uh, for your marketing plans or for your churn reduction or whatever it might be. Um, and I would go uh, a couple of steps further than that. It's to say that I think that predictive analytics um, is actually required for big data um, because big data, uh, if you treat it just as something that needs to be aggregated um, and discovered in a purely descriptive way, uh, you miss out too much. Um, big data tends to be big in two ways, two dimensions, right? There's, there's many variables and there's lots of rows. Uh, and if you don't have good ways of teasing out sort of the long tail of those many rows of data, and if you don't have many uh, good ways of reducing the number of variables that you're looking at, um, then it's very easy to get lost in the size of that data. So if you think about sort of online analytics, for example, there are often many, many variables that you're looking at, many campaigns, many attributes of your website. Uh, many attributes of your customer that you've collected over time, uh, over the web and then through purchases and transactions. There are many variables um, and uh, those can be overwhelming and you need 
uh, techniques like dimensionality reduction, for example, from uh, the world of data mining and predictive analytics to, to compress that complexity. Um, and similarly, you have often nuggets of gold sitting in all of those billions of rows that you need to tease out, and that's not easily done through simple aggregates. Um, so I think predictive analytics, or, or more generally sort of inferential statistics, or data mining, machine learning techniques, uh, uh, that collection of classical techniques that have been used for decades now um, are really coming into their own now because they apply very well in the world of big data uh, to help reduce a lot of that complexity. Um, so those are just some sort of random thoughts about big data and analytics. Let me, um, let me get really to the thesis of my talk, which is how to simplify this whole process. Um, so how is it traditionally done? This is sort of my, um, well, it's, I was going to say tongue-in-cheek. It's not tongue-in-cheek. This is actually a real scenario from uh, a company that I work fairly closely with. Uh, describing uh, what I think is a fairly typical, maybe worst case, but actually I, I'm not sure that it's so atypical, um, uh, analytics process going all the way from data manipulation and data discovery all the way through to model building and model scoring. And so in this particular case there was data preparation, sometimes that's done in the database, uh, sometimes it's done through ETL tools, uh, sometimes it's done through ad hoc scripting. Uh, once you've Clean, cleansed your data and you've got variables that data scientists think are interesting, often you'll extract those into a separate analytics environment for building models, uh, for exploring the data with deeper techniques. Um, once you've iterated a little bit, um, uh, you often come up with then models and statistics that you think are interesting that may be worth pushing into production environment. Even that process is very cumbersome, right? It's not a linear process. You take a look at your data, you come up with models, you realize you need more data or you need different twists on the data. There's a lot of to and fro between the data engineers and the DBAs and the data scientists that's often uh, sort of fraught with difficulty and error and friction. But anyway, at a certain point you get to a model and in this particular case, uh, you had a model that was developed in a standalone analytics tool that then had to be described to the data engineers for, for pushing into production, uh, into testing and production. And so they actually wrote up the spec for the model in an email or a Word document and sent that off then to the engineers for encoding, which seems a little bit crazy to me. Um, this, is, uh, this is something where there's a great deal to be lost in that process and a great deal of error to be introduced and a great deal of extra time to be introduced. Um, but then that gets applied to, say, a database extract. Um, so there's an additional uh, flow of data as part of that analytics workflow and eventually pushed into production. So um, lots of obstacles, uh, cumbersome data movement, uh, a lot of human error, uh, a lot of scalability issues, uh, enforced sampling, uh, deployment problems, and, and so on. So um, a few years ago, when I was working at Greenplum, um, uh, actually, just before I joined there, was a team of uh, academics as well as some employees that were out of companies like uh, Fox, MySpace, um, uh, Amazon, uh, Greenplum itself, um, that had the bright idea, led by Professor Joe Hellerstein at Berkeley, um, that maybe one way of simplifying this whole analytics process is to push the calculations close to the data. You could argue that that's exactly what Hadoop is about. Uh, is having a, a, a platform that's simultaneously for data storage and retrieval, but also for performing complex calculations. Um, so that seems like a good idea. And they coined this acronym MAD, MAD Skills. Um, Joe is a mad, master of the crazy acronym. And, um, and MAD stood for Magnetic, Agile, and Deep. And magnetic means really, you know, your data scientists and your analysts want to get their hands on all of the data. Traditionally, the EDW has repelled data away from itself because it's strictly enforced, it's used for compliance reporting, reporting, it's a single source of truth. But what about if you could use these MPP platforms in a much more magnetic way just to store all of the data that data scientists could possibly want? Don't worry about cleansing it, don't worry about stripping it clean, uh, don't worry about normalizing whatever, just throw all the data in there and let your data scientists have at it, sort of clean it up uh, through the process of doing analytics. Um, so that was sort of the M aspect, making your EDWs and your data platforms a little bit more magnetic for data. The A was about agility. It said that if you could do the analytics close to where the data is and use a single platform for all of your analysis, uh, then you have a much more agile process, sort of agile in the, in the informal sort of everyday meeting, but also sort of borrowing some ideas from the agile development movement. The idea being that rather than have sort of this lengthy six-month process, we are going to build churn models and these are the variables we will have, uh, I mean, data science just doesn't operate in that way. People explore the data, they learn things as they go on. I just got off a phone call just now with a project that I'm running uh, to do uh, uh, stress testing for financial institutions. 
Um, and the great ideas that we had originally generated at the beginning of the project are completely irrelevant, and we've gone off in a completely different direction. It's a much more iterative process, but because we're working close to the data, that's, that's just not a problem. Um, and so that agility, I think, is a really important idea. None of these things are possible without depth in your um, computational platforms, so hence the D in MAD is, is for depth, meaning functional depth. Um, you can't do analysis close to where your data is if your platforms don't support that. So I think that's why the database companies have done a great job in catching up with uh, the philosophy behind Hadoop in, in implementing complex an analysis uh, techniques in the database themselves. And I think all of the big database companies have something to say about that, which is great. So the math skills paper was sort of um, uh, proposing this as an approach, came up with a couple of examples, and most recently the team has actually put out a, um, uh, a sequel to this, if you'll excuse the pun, um, which actually demonstrates a lot of the code uh, that illustrates the points made uh, by the original paper. Um, so it actually is a collection of um, uh, implementations of classic data mining routines um, explained and illustrated in this paper. And there is an open source project, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, which actually contains those implementations. Um, so that was sort of an inspiration for me and for the, for the company that I've gone on to work for at Alpine, uh, the idea of taking that philosophy, that sort of mad approach, that sort of much more agile approach, uh, and making it real. Um, so this leads then to the in-database approach, which really shrinks the analytics workflow, because all of the uh, calculations, or as many as possible, are performed directly where the data sits itself. So you do your data prep in the database. Databases are very good at transformation, so why not do that? Uh, you do your model building and model scoring in the database. That's less intuitive, and I think people don't think necessarily about SQL as being a vehicle for doing uh, predictive analytics, but I'm going to uh, give you a few examples of, of how that works. Um, and then if you've done all of that stuff in the database, then the, mo then the method of deployment becomes almost trivial um, because you're deploying into the same environments where you built. So I think the advantages of this are fairly clear. Um, you get away from sort of cumbersome data movement, a proliferation of data sets sitting out on file servers and the dark recesses of the company, and instead you just have no data movement at all. Uh, instead of having to limit yourselves to data sets and samples, uh, you can uh, use as much of the data as you want. The, your big data platforms become your playground for doing analytics. Uh, and of course, I realize as much as, many, as much as anybody else that the importance of sampling, and, um, uh, and that's, a, that's a technique, it's not a limitation in many cases. Um, but you don't want to have to be forced to do sampling. Uh, and as a friend of mine once said at a large credit card company, it's like, our samples are terabytes big. Um, if you're doing things like fraud detection, for example, it's, it's uh, you know, rare event analysis where you really need to have very large quantities of data just to tease out those, those rare events. Um, getting away from, then from this idea of having siloed analytics towards a more consolidated approach where the data and computation are <coughs> in the same place, uh, I think that uh, a priori it's, it's not true, but in practice it's true that this um, sort of fragmented approach tends to lead to one-shot model development because it's too difficult to go back and get new data and to try out new things. So it tends to be you decide up front what your variables are going to be, and maybe you tweak some transforms, but that's about it. Um, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but I think there's some, some bias towards that in traditional analytics approaches, and much more to just trying new things um, and iterating continuously. <coughs> Deployment is a lot easier, as I said, uh, and the, the beauty of this is if you already have a database infrastructure, you can leverage that for doing your analytics rather than set up a separate infrastructure. Okay, so I want to give two examples of the, um, the in-database approach. Um, one is open source, and then one is the one that I'm working on currently. So the open source one is called Madlib, perhaps not surprisingly. Uh, and it's a set of open source in-database routines for doing uh, data mining. Um, it's uh, a partnership between multiple universities, uh, Wisconsin, uh, University of Wisconsin, uh, Florida and uh, UC Berkeley, and um, leveraging um, the resources that e EMC Greenplum was able to provide. Uh, so I think that that was something innovative as well, is that rather than um, casting something off into the research environment where it's maybe not uh, fully embedded in, uh, I hesitate to say, the real world, 
but also perhaps doesn't have access to the same sort of funding or resources, engineering and testing resources, but neither making it purely uh, a business effort where often you're just going to be motivated by the day-to-day -day concerns. Uh, you have a more broad approach uh, that academics can bring. So being a, but not just throwing money at it either, actually utilizing the resources, the engineering and testing resources and infrastructure resources that a large company can provide. So um, it was an interesting model of collaboration, I think. Um, it's freely available. It's uh, initially intended to be used against Postgres, but it also works against Greenplum, and the Greenplum routines are fully written to be parallelized. And I know the team who's working on this fully invites people from other uh, database platforms to get involved. Uh, it's still fairly early. It's really been in development and getting up and running now for about a year. is isn't fully GA, I would say, uh, but it's very high quality beta code uh, that is actually being used by real companies to do real stuff, as well as some government organizations, I believe. Uh, and it's really designed for data scientists who want to get in there, who want to have robust access to in-database code, and maybe want to tweak it themselves. Most data scientists will want to play around with different routines, and one of the nice things about having an open source approach uh, is that the code is completely transparent and you can do with it what you want. And then there's some links there. Uh, if you just go to madlib.net, you'll have all the information you need. I invite you to take a look. Um, here's just an indication of some of the stuff that the gang there have been working on. Um, there's a whole bunch of sort of supervised and unsupervised learning techniques, many of which you'll recognize. Uh, uh, sort of classic regressions, uh, support vector machines, and naive ways. Um, some very nice stuff like uh, around clustering, k-means clustering, and uh, uh, LDA routines uh, that have been used again by a number of, uh, uh, re used in a number of real world situations by real businesses to do things like text classification. Um, some lovely routines. Um, that Joe kicked off himself around descriptive statistics. Uh, even with a very powerful parallel database, um, it can be still time consuming to do simple things like uh, get, a, get a median or an average or a count of unique records and so on. And so having some approximation routines for that that run really fast can be useful uh, from a data science point of view, but also from an anal uh, application development point of view. Um, and then uh, there's a core library of routines uh, that these functions use. Um, that are mostly written in C, I believe, um, that allow you to um, sort of distance yourself a little bit from the, the, the specifics of the implementation at the database level and also provide some generally applicable functions such as array operations and so on. So just to make this super concrete, here's an example from logistic regression. Um, to all intents and purposes, you can now just run this as a, a SQL expression. It's just a matter of writing some SQL. Um, so it, it, I said, it looks like a store procedure. It is a store procedure uh, that you can run from the Madlib schema. So all you have to do is pass in your data uh, in the form of a, a table and a set of columns with a dependent variable and an array of uh, independent variables, uh, and it'll spit out uh, the coefficients. And uh, the, the uh, iteration is done for a control structure at the highest level, and then all of the math is done uh, in parallel. Um, and then the performance, uh, I'll give some indications of performance later, but it's pretty great. Uh, and you'll get out a full raft of, uh, of statistics, not just the coefficients, but also things like your, your p-values and so on, uh, which you'll need to uh, use to gain the quality of, uh, to assess the quality of your model. Um, and this scales very well. Uh, so this was, uh, I forget exactly how large these data sets, but certainly in the tens of millions of rows. Um, and it's been tested up to much larger data sets than that, certainly into billions, uh, where you're operating now on an increasing number of segments of the parallel server and measuring the elapsed time. Uh, here are three different routines uh, running against the same data set, conjugate gradient, um, uh, three different versions of logistic regression, conjugate gradient, IRLS, and incremental gradient descent. Um, and uh, you can see the relative performance of these and how it shrinks uh, in almost linear fashion as you increase the number of segments. So that's an example from uh, Madlib. And as I say, it's uh, freely available for you to go and take a look. And I think it's very powerful. Uh, and they're continuing development. I think they're planning to have a GA release uh, in a few months' time. I'm not quite sure of the timing. Um, but as I said, people are already using this in uh, sort of development environments. Uh, for example, there's one uh, online media company I know uh, that is using this to do campaign optimization. They have a very large number of variables that they want to regress against in order to determine which features of their online campaigns are having the greatest effect. And something they typically did by writing a whole bunch of Java code, I think it was, outside of the database and doing database extracts, 
when they found out about Madlib, they were like, oh, that's a better way of doing it, and then just shipped all the code into the parallel database. Let me talk a little bit about what we're doing at Alpine in this direction. Um, so I joined Alpine because, uh, um, for, for a number of reasons, but in particular, I've been running analytics projects now for a very long time, and um, I've seen how large and complex they can be and how they can get bogged down by uh, a lot of to and froing of the data uh, and the obstacles you run into. And in fact, I built some analytics applications before in the past, uh, again, that operated in standalone. And I found myself building parallel routines for doing large-scale analytics and actually building an application that required uh, a sort of multi-tenant architecture, uh, sorry, a multi-node architecture uh, that involved me figuring out how to parallelize these routines. And it seemed to me there was a general problem waiting here to be solved. Uh, and Madlib was definitely going in that direction. Uh, but Madlib, um, for all the benefits that I've just been talking about, is still a very low level uh, uh, functional framework um, that I think is not necessarily applicable to, say, the average data scientist or business analyst who just wants to point an application at a set of data and, perform and get some results. And so what we've done at Alpine is to develop uh, an intuitive sort of data mining engine and an intuitive sort of workflow editor uh, that uses techniques similar to Madlib, although we also have proprietary routines. Um, in fact, many, most of our routines are proprietary because we want to squeeze every last bit of performance and we can make certain assumptions about the platforms that we're using. Um, uh, and it's also um, many platforms at this point, uh, Greenplum, uh, Postgres, Oracle, Oracle Exadata, Netiza, and DB2. Um, and what it appears to be to the end user is a fairly standard sort of data mining application, or well, I think we have a lot of usability features thrown in that make it very powerful, but nevertheless it'll look familiar to most data scientists as a collection of routines that I can apply to my data, uh, but all of the calculations are done directly in, at the source of data itself. So this gives you um, a sort of end-to-end -end analytics workflow. It means that you can do all of your transformations and then your model building and model scoring uh, directly in the same application without needing to move around from one application to another. Um, I think it's fairly easy to use. Uh, it means you have a, a, a enormous scalability that you have by uh, virtue of using the data platform as a calculation platform, um, and deployment becomes a lot easier. And I think the key thing that seems to be resonating with our customers, Alpine is still fairly early yet, just been around for um, just over a year, but the key thing that seems to be resonating with our customers is the idea of, sure, the scalability is great, the lack of cumbersome data movement, and so on, all those things I already talked about, but the idea that I can actually cover the entire analytics workflow in a single application is very powerful because I'm not moving data around. I, I can actually do everything from data transformation to uh, model building and evaluation scoring in the, same, in the same workflow, literally in the same diagram, uh, is, is a powerful thing. Um, we support all the standard phases of the analytics workflow. Um, and again, just to emphasize the point here, um, we're not just doing the data mining uh, and modeling. Uh, uh, we're also doing the stuff that happens before that, uh, data exploration and transformation and so on, and all the stuff that comes after it, uh, such as scoring and evaluation of models and even pushing those out to a production environment. Uh, and, uh, you know, that certainly requires a, a lot of work on our part of building an application, but it's made a lot easier by this approach of working directly where the data sits. Um, because there is no data movement required, it means that the, all of the steps of the analytics workflow can take place within the same environment and therefore the same application. So just to give you an example of how this works in the, in the real world then, um, this is an example that I based, uh, I sort of masked the data and so on, but this is based on a real world example that we built for Telco. Uh, this was a, um, uh, a decently sized uh, Telco um, that had only sort of limited um, uh, progress into the development of churn models. And we wanted to demonstrate how we could build those in a fairly straightforward way, uh, but still provide powerful and real models. Um, and I'll take you through the steps that we went through in order to do that. So the first thing, of course, was to explore the data. Um, and uh, there are a number of things that we did. This workflow is enormously uh, um, simplified because there was an awful lot of exploration that we did um, in order to get to know the data. But for one example was that we looked, for example, just at something as simple as account frequencies. 
Uh, and then we looked at certain attributes of those account frequencies and realized that it was really the top six or seven um, that were going to be useful for modeling. The others had sort of odd characteristics or only uh, accounted for a very small proportion of the population. So in order to come up with high quality models that would still give us the biggest uh, business benefit, um, uh, we restricted to those top accounts. So that ability to look into the data, come up with some summary statistics, draw histograms and box plots and all that sort of thing, uh, is something that you can do directly from within the tool. And again, without even thinking about predictive analytics at this point, but just sort of simple data mining routines, the ability to, for example, execute a simple SQL query that returns uh, all of your quantiles in order for building uh, a box plot is a very powerful thing. It's not that complicated to do, but it's something that I think people don't necessarily think to do. They're more used to extracting it out of the database and running it through R. But if instead you can go straight to the source of the data and build a box plot out of that, that takes a lot of time out of your day. If you're like my teams, they tend to run things like uh, histograms and frequency charts and, and box plots several times, if not dozens of times a day. Uh, the idea that I don't have to sort of move that from one data environment to another is, is, is I think, an important idea. Uh, the next thing to do is to uh, do some data transformation. Uh, so we did things like uh, filtering out rows, just to those uh, accounts that we're interested in, joining uh, data together. We had the original account data, uh, which told us whether the accounts had churned, for example, and the payments and so on. Uh, some subscription data, uh, even things like call quality. So we were able to look at call transactions, individual calls that have been made, and determine where the call quality was a factor in churn. Then we added um, various variables, uh, not just the dependent variable, or did they churn? There was no flag that said this person churned. We actually had to look at the account records to determine that. But other variables, transformations, and so on, on top of the original data. And then we entered the model building phase. And this is fairly simple. We had created these variables. Most of them were just variables that were already present in the data. Some of these we had actually transformed um, yeah, in, in one way or another. But at this point, it was just a matter of picking those variables to enter into the model and then running uh, the logistic regression. And in this case, it's our own sort of proprietary version of the logistic regression, but very similar to the thing that you just saw in the Madlib library. And then we spit out a set of results, uh, standard charts and statistics and so on, uh, so you can evaluate that, uh, and then go back in and say, select more data or change your variables and so on and so on. So as a result of this, then you get your model, and you can, as you see in this workflow here, we have uh, the regression being built against a sample that had been taken from that original data set. And when I say sample, I'm not, again, I need to repeat myself now, I'm not extracting anything out of the database, I'm just sort of subsetting the table of data that I'm working with. Uh, and then I run that regression uh, against another training set uh, in order to come up with my fit statistics, uh, and then actually score it against the very original data set to get a full set of scores against my customer set. Um, so this entire workflow for this particular customer, uh, tens of millions of uh, uh, records, um, ran in, in less than a minute for the entire end-to-end -end flow, which is pretty cool. And we ran, we run simulations doing the sort of thing where we can run logistic regressions on billions of rows in just a matter of minutes. Uh, so that's all very cool. But to me, what is really interesting is the fact that we did this proof of concept for the customer in just a single afternoon. Uh, so it was a a last-minute call from the sales group of saying, you know, we're, we're, we're in a POC where we're sort of demonstrating the speed of the database. We want to do something a little bit more interesting. Can we build, we have all this rich data. Can we do something cool with it? And we said, well, let's just build a churn model. It's something that they expressed that that's the reason why they are interested in building this data platform. Uh, and so one of the data scientists on my team brought out our miner, pointed at the database, uh, and started running this, uh, started building this workflow. Now, I'm not saying, of course, um, think that I'm saying that you would be able to take this model and just push it into production and, and you're done. Um, that would be, I think, a little foolhardy. You want to go through a little bit more iteration, perhaps, and a little bit more rigorous testing. But nevertheless, the, uh, I don't remember exactly how good the models were in terms of the statistics, but they were decent models, and the coefficients made sense, and the signs were correct, and so on. Uh, and the fact that you could uh, come up with something like that just in the length of a lazy afternoon seems, uh, I think, very compelling. So, um, you know, I've, uh, I've seen this approach applied now in, in, in many different situations. We've used this for building churn models, as I've shown. I think I already mentioned that we're working on bank stress testing, so using uh, transactional data to do predictions of default behavior at the loan level 
uh, for, financial, for one financial organization that we're working with, so that we can come up with aggregate models um, of how the bank reacts to differing macroeconomic factors, uh, and therefore use those in simulations as part of federally mandated stress testing. Um, and the reason why we're doing this with this financial organization is because they have to do this, I think, every quarter. Um, and that's a time-consuming process, and the more that we can wrap that up in a simple workflow and just use the latest data and plug it into the same workflow, maybe tweaking a few factors here and there, uh, the, the, the less expensive it is from a point of view of human capital and, and money. Um, and so that's, uh, that's another very powerful example. We're also working with healthcare organizations uh, where we're identifying uh, patient pathways and uh, something where uh, big data analytics I think can come to bear is identifying of course all the standard pathways you go through for particular diseases and symptoms and so on but also teasing out those uh, unusual pathways that a doctor might not be aware of but that are only revealed in large quantities of data uh, with techniques that are able to tease out uh, those sort of long tails. Um, so, uh, coming up with patient outcomes that are likely to be successful but may not be widely known is another thing that we're working on, on that I think is, uh, is I think really compelling as well. So I think the in-database approach has certainly, in my experience, proven its worth. Uh, and if you're interested in trying it out, you can uh, go and take a look at the MADLIB libraries if you're interested in some, uh, some open source functions that you can customize and play with. Uh, and if you're interested in seeing what we're doing at Alpine, uh, you can go and take a look at uh, the application by downloading a trial version. Okay, thanks very much.